Uh, welcome to another edition of the Voice of Palestine. It's February 9th, 2013th, and I'm your co-host, Hanna Kawas. This week we'll be interviewing Sean Clinton from Ireland about the campaign calling for a boycott of Israeli diamonds. Sean uh, is a, a pro-Palestinian activist, and he will update us on why and how the campaign was formed and the limitation of the Kimberley process in banning all blood diamonds. Uh, welcome to the Voice of uh, Palestine, Sean, and we appreciate it that you are uh, going to give our listener overview of what's happening uh, uh, with the campaign uh, to boycott Israeli diamonds. To start with, could you please give us uh, uh, some overview about the solidarity work in Ireland? Okay, well, uh, thank you very much, Hannah, for inviting me on uh, Voice of Palestine. I'm very happy to talk to you. Uh, as you said, I'm, I'm a, a Palestine solidarity activist. I'm involved in the Ireland-Palestine solidarity campaign, where we have a very active campaign here in Ireland, a very active group uh, with branches all around Ireland, various different cities in Ireland. And it's, uh, it's, we do a lot of work to raise awareness about the whole uh, Middle East uh, conflict and the Israeli-Palestinian. Uh, conflict and uh, the abuses by Israel of the, of the human rights of Palestine in particular, we highlight that on a weekly basis. So uh, the Diamond Campaign is just one aspect of our campaign. We have a number of other different campaigns uh, focusing on various different areas of the, of, of, uh, of the Israeli interest and uh, of uh, true relations with Israel and, and other things like that. But the Diamond issue is, is the area that I focus on in particular. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And now, uh, I, I, I first became interested in, in the diamond issue back in 2006 uh, after the uh, Israeli-Lebanon war. Yes. And uh, at that stage, I started to ask myself questions about exactly how a country the size of Israel can sustain the world's fourth most powerful military force. And it was that that led me on to examine the Israeli economy and start asking questions about how much it costs them to sustain the occupation and the brutal subjugation of Palestine and asking questions about where that money comes from. Yeah. And when you start to look at the Israeli economy and look at what it produces, it very quickly becomes evident that diamonds are an enormous part of that economy. And to a large extent, it's a diamond-funded economy that many people probably wouldn't realize because uh, most people realize that Israel, is, it, 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 they talk a lot about their high-tech industry, their pharmaceutical and their electronics, which is important. But when you examine Israel's exports, uh, it is quickly discovered that diamonds are far more important. They're, they're Israel's number one export commodity. Yes. And in fact, they account for about 30% of Israel's manufacturing exports, which is huge for any one country to be, in, to be yeah. so dependent on, on one, one commodity like that. Yeah, and uh, it's uh, almost a $12 billion sale? Well, actually, the, the gross figure in 2011 was $22 billion. $22 and the net $22 billion. It's, it's a yeah. staggering amount. Yeah. And, and the net value of, of that was $11 billion in, uh, of in uh, diamond exports in yeah. 2011. Yeah. And when, when you consider that Israel's military expenditure in 2011 is put down at about $14 billion, uh-huh. and here they have, they're getting $11 billion net, net that is, from, from diamond exports coming into the economy. It's, it's, so it it's really is it's a diamond-funded occupation, and 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 that's what uh, that's the message we're trying to get across to people. It's it's yeah. the diamond uh, revenue is a very significant proportion of the revenue going to the to the Israeli military. And and you know I mean uh, really uh, in the third world in uh, Africa and many of the poorer countries you don't find people can afford buying diamonds, <laughs> let alone you know. Uh, of course not. Yeah, yeah. So it's basically what I'm trying to say is basically it's from the West. You know, uh, it's not only they get their military assistance uh, from the U.S. and European countries, but also the economic. This is a, a, a clear example of the... Oh, absolutely. Uh, and uh, and it's, it's something that's hidden, largely hidden. Like in 2011, uh, from America alone, uh, polished diamond, and uh, the net value of polished diamonds from America alone was 2.8 billion uh, into the Israeli economy. So that's 
Diamond purchasers in the, in the U.S. are providing nearly as much revenue to the Israeli economy as the, Israel, as the U.S. is giving in military aid. Yes. And this is something that's been overlooked the whole time. And, and, the, and the fact of the matter is that these diamonds are funding a regime that is guilty of war crimes. Yes. And yet, jewelers all around the world are selling these diamonds to their customers and saying that they're conflict-free diamonds. Yes. It's a complete fraud. Yes. And, and this is what we're trying to get across to people, that when you purchase a diamond that's processed in Israel, you're helping to fund a regime that's guilty of war crimes mm -hmm. on a daily basis. You know? yes. in, in addition to uh, tax-deductible donations, which is a huge amount, really, that yes. comes from the U.S. and Europe also, because, uh, you know, all, all these tax deductions, even they, they, send, they send these monies to settlements, uh, you know, which uh, the, the Western world claim that they are against uh, against them uh, because they are against international law, but in spite yeah. of that, they fund uh, these settlements by allowing tax deductible uh, donations to go to settlements. Yeah, well, yeah. And, and, and like the Western world, it talks plenty and it says it condemns the, the settlements and it's it's uh, words are words are cheap, but they take no action. They, they don't uh, they don't impose any sanctions on Israel for its illegal activity in in, in the settlements building settlements continuously in the West Bank yeah. in in violation of international law. Yeah, the same with the EU, isn't it? Because uh, oh, completely, completely. Yeah. The EU is is. is uh, the, the EU, EU is uh, subsidizing imp Israeli imports into the EU yes. by virtue of the EU-Israel agreement. So, uh, and uh, Article 2 of that agreement explicitly states that, that Israel must abide by human rights standards, normal human rights standards, mm -hmm. which it has never done since the day the agreement was signed. Mm -hmm. And yet the, the EU uh, fails to impose sanctions on Israel. Yeah, and also, also the, the allowing uh, uh, products from Israeli legal settlements. I'm not sure how is the campaign going there, but could you tell us? I'm sure uh, the Irish Solidarity Committee is, uh, is emphasizing on it, uh, the legal uh, Israeli Oh, yes, well, that, that's, a, that's an issue. That, uh, in fact, that's something that it seems to be gaining more momentum at government level. If, uh, that's one aspect, I think, that we may see some movement on is a move to, uh, uh, for more accurate labeling of, of products from the settlements. Yeah, yeah. But uh, it's really, the settlements are only a small part of the production, and it's That's really, uh, the, the Palestinians have called for a boycott of all Israeli goods. And that's what we should be highlighting, I think, in particular. No, that's that's true. We we here in the solidarity movement, also in Vancouver, we really don't differentiate between uh, them. But uh, to show the hypocrisy of the Western oh, world, you know, that we they they even allowing uh, support for uh, illegal products that comes from uh, illegal settlements. So uh, it's good to talk about it once in a while. But like you said, you know, mm. uh, to for Israel to abide by international law, they they need to feel the uh, effect of the a total boycott, like uh, what happened uh, with the South African apartheid regime, don't you think? Yes, so? because, uh, like, we know that Israel, Israel is, is protected politically and uh, financially by, by the Western, Western countries. Uh, no matter what uh, war crimes Israel commits in full public view, Western governments still won't impose sanctions. And, and that situation, unfortunately, doesn't seem to be going to change anytime, uh, anytime soon. Mm -hmm. Israel is secure politically and militarily and, and financially because of the protection afforded it by the West. Mm -hmm. So it's up to civil society by means of, of boycott, mm -hmm. uh, uh, particularly, to impose sanctions on Israel. And, in fact, we're getting back to the Diamond Campaign. If you look at the Diamond Campaign, that's one area where we really yeah. can impose significant financial uh, sanctions on Israel by highlighting the issue that diamonds from Israel, which are sold worldwide as conflict-free diamonds mm -hmm. and which constitute a major part of the, of the, uh, of the diamond market, 50% of the diamonds sold in America are processed in Israel. Mm -hmm. So by highlighting the fact that these diamonds are funding war crimes and should be correctly called blood diamonds, we can, and civil society can impose sanctions on Israel. Yeah. And that's what we need to do. Yeah, and uh, really silence on these uh, crimes uh, is complicity. I mean, uh, on the, in the issue of the diamond thing, although uh, the, the, the U.S. and the other Western powers uh, are not really silent, they are complicit directly and uh, effectively oh, absolutely. in these Israeli war crimes.
But with the case of the diamond, I think each individual that buys this diamond and keeps silence about it is really complicit in these war crimes, don't you? Yeah. Well, I, I think the companies that sell these diamonds and falsely label them as, as conflict-free, that's what we need. These are the, the companies that we need to, to, to hold up to scrutiny and ask them about their diamonds. And like, particularly if you look at the, in Canada, for example, where you have Harry Winston, one of the biggest uh, uh, diamond companies in, in Canada, and it owns... Uh, for, it is, at the moment, it owns 40% of, of Canada's largest diamond mine, the Diavik mine. Mm -hmm. And in fact, it's about to buy out the other remaining 60% from, I think it's Rio Tinto. At the moment, it's in negotiations to buy out the, the remainder of that diamond, uh, that, of that mine. And the Harry Winston Company gets, exports 30% of its rough diamonds to Israel. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it, what's happening, and, and that's where the most value is added to the diamond. The rough diamonds are, are only a, represent po probably about 10% of the value of the cut and polished diamond. So 90% of the value of, of the diamond is, is, is generated at the cutting and polishing stage and later on. Yeah. So really, the most benefit from Canadian diamonds is, is, being, is, is going to the Israeli companies where Harry Winston exports 30% of, of Canada's uh, diamonds from the Diavik mine. Yeah, and uh, when, he, when he gets control of the 100% of it, I imagine that would be pro rata as well. That he still sends quite a large percentage of those diamonds to Israel for cutting and polishing. Yeah. And in fact, they're brought back then and, and distributed worldwide and sold as Canadian, conflict-free Canadian diamonds, mm -hmm. which is another fraud, yeah. uh, labeling them as Canadian diamonds when in fact they're cut and polished in Israel and funding war crimes in Israel. Yeah. So that's something else that needs to be exposed. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I think uh, Prime Minister Harper uh, doesn't need to be exposed. He's exposing himself anyway. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's yeah he's, he, he's, he's really, uh, you know, going all out to support these uh, Israeli war crimes. He has a despicable record. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I yeah. mean, it's, uh, it's amazing. You know, we used really to put an effort to, in exposing the Canadian government complicity because they used to hide with, with, behind, you know, neutrality and peacekeeping and all that, but we don't yes. need to do it anymore. So, you know, I want to go back to the diamond, the, the polishing and the cutting. There is uh, also alternatives. I hear that India uh, is, uh, there is uh, emerging uh, industry there. Uh, in oh, well, not so only, no, it, it's, it's India would cut more diamonds, cut and polish more diamonds than Israel, far more diamonds in yeah. terms of uh, carrots. That's the weight of diamonds. Yeah. But what happens is, India, where the, where the labor is much cheaper than in Israel, Israel India cuts the smaller diamonds, mm -hmm. whereas Israel specializes in the larger diamonds, the more valuable diamonds. Mm -hmm. So although Israel cuts fewer diamonds in terms of carat and weight of diamonds, it's the value of the diamonds cut and polished in Israel far exceeds that of, of cut and polished in, in India because of the fact that the diamonds in Israel are far more valuable than the larger diamonds. Yeah. So, but, but, uh, but you also uh, get diamonds uh, cut and polished in, there are some diamonds cut and polished in Canada and the Northwest Territories. And very few, in fact, but uh, just recently this week I've seen a, a new article that some company has taken over two cutting and polishing factories that were closed down. And uh, Yes. They're coming back into production, hopefully. But at the moment, I think there is only one company in the Northwest Territories yeah. that, uh, that is cutting and polishing diamonds. Yeah. So, but, but the most the most they get is about 10% of the of the run of the mine production. 10% to stay in Canada. The rest are, are go overseas for cutting and polishing. Yeah. And not to forget, also the Northwest Territory are uh, indigenous lands, and uh, most of this, these diamonds are stolen. But it looks to me that it's stupid, you know, to send it halfway around the world to polish it yeah. in Israel rather than uh, polishing it in, in and cutting it in. Yeah, ab absolutely. In there Canada. should be a, a vibrant polishing, cutting and polishing industry yeah. in Canada, you know, yeah. uh, rather than putting all those jobs overseas in, in, in Israel and elsewhere, and where the, more, the most of the benefit is accruing then at, the, at that stage. Yeah, yeah, so uh, it's good you expose that, really, because most of our listeners uh, don't uh, realize these basic facts that uh, yeah. Canada is, is, uh, is uh, complicit in uh, sending these diamonds to Israel, where yeah. they, like you said in your, uh, I'd like to 
talk about this press release that you issued on February 1st and the, the support you are getting from the Palestinian organizations. Uh, well, yeah, yeah, that, that's quite an interesting development. Nearly 100 uh, civil society organizations have now signed that statement uh, calling for women and men of conscience worldwide and Judas to reject Israeli diamonds and to end the trade in, in Israeli blood diamonds. So that's uh, hopefully uh, that's something that we can build on and gain momentum from the fact that so many organizations are calling for uh, for people of conscience to reject Israeli diamonds. Yeah, and uh, really, and really, it, uh, it's uh, done by the solidarity groups, or do you have an organization just responsible uh, to overseeing uh, uh, the, the boycott uh, of Israeli diamond? Well, we, we have a group, all right. Like in, I coordinate the, uh, the Diamond Campaign for the Ireland-Palestine Solidarity Campaign mm -hmm. and for the Boycott Israel Network in the UK. And we have people in London who are, London who are very active on this front, and they have been uh, highlighting the issue of uh, De Beers' Forever Mark Diamond in the Tower of London. I don't know if you're familiar with that, mm -hmm. where De Beers put a, a, a diamond, cut and polished, a forever marked diamond that's cut and polished by the Steinmetz Diamond Group yeah. on display in the Tower of London to honor the Queen's Jubilee. But, but the Steinmetz Diamond Group uh, funded and supported the Gavati Brigade during the Israeli assault in Gaza in 2008, cast lead. And the Gavati Group uh, was directly responsible for the massacre of the Samouni family. Mm -hmm. when 21 members of the Snooney family were killed by this group. So the Bears have put on this forever marked diamond on display in the Tower of London, and people in London have been protesting about it mm. for the last year. Yeah, good. So uh, that's just another example yeah. of the complicity yeah. of, of, of these major diamond companies. O also in, in the in press release you talk about the connection between, you know, you mentioned the Givati Brigade, etc., but it really goes uh, also directly to the so-called IDF, the, the Israeli oh, yeah. uh, war uh, uh, machine. Yes, mm. yes. Uh, uh, the Israeli political economist, uh, Sher Heber, in evidence to the Russell Tribunal on Palestine, he estimated that uh, the Israeli diamond industry generates approximately $1 billion per year in funding for the Israeli military. Mm -hmm. So that's quite a huge uh, support for the Israeli military as a direct result of, of revenue from the Israeli diamond industry. And this is something that most people have no idea about, that diamonds are funding the Israeli military by a tune of $1 billion per year. It's mm. by far the biggest single source of revenue going to the Israeli diamond industry, I'd imagine. That's almost 50% of what they get of American military. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. 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 So you and, and yet the, the, these diamonds are being sold worldwide by some of the world's leading jewelry brand names, and they're claiming that these diamonds are conflict-free. And, and uh, yeah. in, in two weeks' time, we'll have the spectacle of the Oscars, where we have some of these leading diamond companies again. If you look at Harry Winston, look at De Beers, Shoppard, and uh, Rattini, these are, the, these are the, the jewelers to the stars. And they'll be draping these Oscar nominees with diamonds that are cut and polished in Israel and claiming that these are beautiful symbols of love and romance, when in fact... For funding the brutal occupation and subjugation of Palestine. Yeah, yeah. And if, 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 if you look at, uh, we've got set up a Facebook page uh, to raise awareness about this. And we know that just on the 23rd of January, for example, one of the latest victims of, of, of the Israeli war criminals, uh, a young Palestinian lady, uh, mm -hmm. Lubna Hanash, was shot and killed uh, close to Bethlehem, a 22 year old girl, a student in the university there. Yeah. And yet, these yeah. diamonds would be adorning the stars on the, on the red carpet uh, in, in two or three weeks' time yes. that are funding the same soldiers. That, that and she's one out of six who were murdered in cold blood, uh, really. That's right. Yeah, six just unarmed one, Palestinians yeah. alone in January. Yeah, yeah in January. So it, it shows really uh, the brutality of the Israeli military, and uh, supporting it is really supporting uh, uh, war crimes and uh, having uh, blood on their hands, really, to, to put it mildly. 
really. Absolutely, uh, yeah. Yeah. So uh, you know, um, the uh, the campaign uh, is uh, trying really what to do: picket or raise awareness or all of the above. Uh, uh, yeah. All, well, all of the above. We have quite a lot of levers that we can uh, that we can use. For example, the Kimberley process this year is cheered by South Africa. Yeah. And the big the, the big issue on the agenda for the Kimberley process is a review of the definition of a conflict diamond. Mm. Now, the, uh, if uh, your listeners may be aware that the Kimberley process is the international regulations uh, set up in 2003 to end the trade, supposedly to end the trade in blood diamonds. But what happened was, rather than banning all diamonds to fund gross human rights violations, the diamond industry, uh, well, they circled the wagons and they, to, to protect their industry, they came up with this definition of a conflict diamond, mm. which is restricted to rough diamonds that fund rebel groups that, are, uh, that uh, finance conflict against legitimate governments. Yeah. Now, this means that all other diamonds, if, if they're not rough diamonds used by rebel groups, all other diamonds, yeah. regardless of what human rights violations that they may be funding, they're not regarded as conflict diamonds or blood diamonds, mm. and, and their jewelers can claim that they're conflict-free. Yeah. Now, that, that, that system worked, uh, that scam, I should say, worked for a few years until such time as the problems arose in Zimbabwe, yeah. where government forces in Zimbabwe took over the mines in the Morang area, Morang, Morang area, and killed 200 miners. Yeah. But the Kimberley process then discovered that they could not ban these diamonds from this area because the violence was carried out by government forces, not by rebels, and they didn't fit the qualification as a conflict diamond. Mm -hmm. And yeah. this is an issue that the Kimberley process is still grappling with. Yeah. They cannot ban diamonds that are funding human rights violations yeah. by government forces. Yeah. And of course, yeah. all the members of the Kimberley process have a veto, and Israel is refusing to allow an expansion of the definition of a conflict diamond because yeah. their diamonds would then be caught if that happened. Yeah, but to be frank with you, Sean, it seems this whole process is a sham because if it serves U.S. interests, they won't have opened their mouth. But if the rebel forces are against U.S. interests and Western interests in the region, then, uh, you know, they, they, if, if it is uh, uh, in support of uh, these uh, rebel movements in support of Western interests, they, we, I bet you they won't say a word about it. That's true. In fact, uh, the, one of the leading uh, jewelry magazines in the U.S., uh, JCK magazine, had an inter interesting article back during the summer where they were saying, just imagine if these diamonds, if, if diamonds, if, Sy if Syria had diamonds, yeah. how they would be up and how they would, how they would need to ban those diamonds from Syria. Now, there, are, there aren't any diamonds from Syria, mm -hmm. but they were completely ignoring the fact that, uh, that the Golan, part of Syria, is occupied by Israel, uh, a, a state that's stands accused of war crimes that's one of the biggest producers of, of, of diamonds in the world or, or manufacturers of cut and polished diamonds and yet they're not talking about that mm -hmm. you know yeah so it's so the hypocrisy yeah. in, in the diamond industry is, is yeah. total yeah, and you know this uh, Kimberley process, like you said, they refuse to certify. Have you approached them to certify the uh, Israel? Oh yes. Yeah. They, they, they completely ignore us. Uh, naturally enough, they, 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 we've uh, petitioned them, and we've sent over 2,000. We've sent uh, a, a petition signed by over 2,000 signatures to them, yeah. to the chair of the Kimberley process, and uh, asking them for to broaden the definition of a conflict diamond to include diamonds that fund human rights violations yeah. by government forces, including yeah. cut and polished diamonds yeah. uh, from Israel. And these are the biggest, the Israeli military. Yeah, these are the biggest terrorists, really, because it's, <laughs> it's on a massive scale. I mean, uh, when you have an army committing terrorist acts, uh, it pales compared to individual terrorist acts, doesn't it? Absolutely. When you have an army that will drop white phosphorus in the dense, most densely populated area yeah. on Earth, on the Gaza Strip, what they did in 2008, what they did again back last November when they killed 170 Palestinians, mainly civilians, including 33 children. Mm -hmm. And yet the world stands by and jewelers are still prepared to sell these diamonds from Israel that are funding that regime. Yeah. And what consumers need to be made aware of this. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, that's our task. Yeah, that, that's that's true. And uh, really, uh, you know, I mean, it's a, it's a duty of us as civil society to, uh, you know, to point that out and to gain support, because uh, I think the, we shouldn't accept 
they expect the UN or the the European or Western powers to uh, enforce uh, these uh, humane, uh, uh, basically conditions on uh, you know and and speak out against uh, these inhumane uh, practices that Israel commits. And also we yeah. don't expect it from Arab regimes because they are uh, complicit with the, the uh, foreign powers in maintaining the status quo in the Middle East and actually not just that, they are supporting the status quo by buying, uh, you know, like Saudi Arabia for example in 2011 was the largest uh, weapon uh, uh, importers. Uh, they purchased 33.3 billion dollars uh, from the U.S. Uh, and this is uh, not just uh, supporting the U U.S. military industry, but also supporting the U.S. economy, uh, which, yes, is, yeah. which is uh, really, w without it, could have gone over the cliff like they were. Yeah, well, uh, of course, a lot of these Arab regimes are puppet regimes of the West, supported and held in place by the West, like by American support. Yeah, you know? yeah. So, so it's, uh, that's why it's more important uh, that the Arab people and the people of uh, conscience all over the world to, to you know, uh, speak out and support this campaign. Is, uh, do you have a website and are you still, uh, do you take individual endorsers or just groups endorsers? And uh, at, 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 well, at, at the moment we're just looking for group endorsements yeah. for, for, the, uh, for the statement issued by Palestinian Civil Society. That's been endorsed by, yeah. I think it's 93 or 94 groups at the moment. Yeah. So and that's what we're looking for. If, if there are any other groups that want to endorse it, they can. It's on the, we've got a Facebook page for uh, the boycott campaign, the Boycott Israeli Diamonds Facebook page. Yeah. And we've also got pages on the Ireland Palestine Solidarity Campaign oh. uh, website. That's www.ipsc.ie. Yeah. And also on the Boycott Israel Network site in the UK yeah. and on the Innovative Minds website in the UK. Yeah. That's, you, um, yeah. they've, all, they've all got pages dealing with the diamond issue. Yeah, and, and, and people get more information about really, because we can't really cover all the uh, uh, important uh, information in uh, half an hour or so. Yeah. But, uh, That's true. Yeah. So, if people, so if, if people if people check out the Facebook page in particular, it's got a lot of very useful links on that yeah. information. Yeah. And uh, also, you mentioned something about the petition. Uh, is it? You said it's still not going, or is it? No, that that's not going. That was yeah. uh, prior to the Kimberley process meeting yeah. in 2011. Yeah. And we sent that to the the chair of the Kimberley process. Yeah. But don't you but, think, Sean, it's important at this stage also to try to uh, to have have a petition where uh, people of conscience uh, could uh, pledge that they're going to support the campaign and pledge not to buy the the uh, it, that's something diamond. You know, yeah, that's something maybe we should consider doing, leaving that up and run, leaving it there running the whole time. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. That's what I mean. And you know, building momentum and make people mm -hmm. feel part of the process, which will be yeah. great. And uh, for sure, uh, we in Voice of Palestine, by the way, endorse this campaign. Uh, the uh, your campaign uh, to boycott the Israeli blood diamond, and uh, we we will be willing to really to try to uh, mobilise people for such a such a uh, you know. Yes, well, well, uh, particularly in Canada, where you have a big influence in Canada because you're exporting so many of your diamonds to Israel, mm -hmm. and without those raw diamonds, the Israeli diamond industry just can't function. And of course, the same applies in South Africa, where uh, a lot of rough diamonds from South Africa are also exported to Israel. Yeah. So, and with South Africa chairing the Kimberley process this year, uh, hopefully the issue of Israeli blood diamonds can be Brought put into the public uh, discourse. Yeah, that's that's great. Uh, and raise awareness about it. Yeah, yeah. You know, uh, it's it's funny you mentioned Canada because lots of people here. Oh, we don't send aid to Israel, you know, and they forget about all this indirect aid, whether through the the free trade agreement or whether the, the military cooperation, the military industrial complex here uh, has cross relationship with the Israeli military, or through these economic things. 
things, which is really essential mm. for Israeli survival. So you don't have to give direct aid like in the U.S., you know, to say, you yes. know, we, we're not uh, complicit with Israeli war crimes. Actually, just giving them political support is complicity in uh, political crime, uh, war, war crime. And this is true for uh, the Britain, isn't it, uh, Sean? Could you t tell us a bit about the role of the British government, although, you know, they, they, they speak well about, uh, you know, the uh, settlements and how Gaza is a big concentration camp, a big prison. Oh, yeah, yeah. And that well, is yeah, all Western governments speak well, but uh, about the uh, and, and object to various different aspects of the Israeli occupation. But the uh, words are cheap; they, they don't take any action, and yeah. that's the critical thing. If they don't take any action, the words are meaningless, really, you know. And they don't back up the words with any action. So, it's in fact, I think the UK is one of Israel's most important export markets in the in the in the EU, and. Uh, there are so many various different agreements and trade agreements with them between England and and Israel, between, yeah. between Britain and and and, and Israel. Yeah. So it's um, it's hard to see that changing too quickly unless. Uh, but even if public opinion did rally out against it, like it did the time of the Iraq War when one million people uh, marched in the street, the British government still paid no attention to that. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. So, um, uh, but I think the growing public awareness of Israel's crimes uh, is causing a lot more people to exercise the boycott option. And people, like today, we were out in the street in Dublin mm -hmm. and uh, raising awareness about the diamond issue just ahead of Valentine's Day in, in Grafton Street, Dublin. Uh, that's Ireland's premier shopping street. And the reaction of people is always positive uh, when we're out there campaigning for Palestine rights. People in Ireland have a very good appreciation of the of the situation out there. We have our own history of occupation here, so we knew quite a lot. We know what it's like to be occupied, yeah. and the Irish people have great sympathy and empathy with the Palestinian cause. So uh, we always get a great reception when we're out on the street. Yeah, no, and the history of the uh, even Irish uh, uh, all over the world, including Irish immigrants to North America, is clear that they really side with the oppressed rather than oh. the oppressor. Actually, oh, we were, yeah. we're going to play at the end of this uh, show uh, St. Patrick Battalion uh, song for David Rovix to salute you and salute all those who support, <laughs> who support uh, you know. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, David Rovix is yeah. great. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, uh, just uh, do you have uh, one final thoughts to our listeners, and uh, you know uh, how can they uh, get really active in this campaign well, and in the larger campaign, really the BDS yeah. movement in general? Well, uh, I would say to people just to remember that you know the, the Israeli economy. It's it, when you look at the Israeli economy and look at what's important to the Israeli economy. And it's, uh, by the way, you'll, you'll see graphs of Israel's exports on the, on the Boycott Israel, uh, Boycott Israeli Diamonds Facebook page. And then when you look at, when you study those graphs and see what's important to the Israeli economy and how important the diamonds are by comparison to all other products. But when you think about it, uh, people have, shown that there were people all over the world have shown a rejection of blood diamonds. Mm -hmm. And so people who may not know much about the Israel-Palestine conflict can still be convinced to reject diamonds that are processed in Israel once they realize that these diamonds are blood diamonds. So to get talking about that and force the, the jewelry industry to address this issue, I believe it's one of the most powerful uh, leverage points that we have Mm -hmm. against Israel. And uh, the more people talk about it, the more awareness grows about it. Mm -hmm. So I would say to, to press that lever as often as you can and keep raising it with, with shooters in particular. And that way, uh, public information and public awareness grows about the issue. Yeah. Uh, we really thank you for speaking with us, Sean, and uh, keep up the good work and stay in touch. And uh, thanks again, uh, and uh, uh, we hope uh, Palestine will be free soon. Uh, thank you very much, Hannah. Uh, absolutely. Thank you so much for uh, having me on your program. It's a great pleasure to talk to you. Yeah. Thanks, and uh, have a good day. Bye-bye. You too. You too. And that was Hana Kawas talking with Sean Clinton from Ireland. And with that, we conclude another edition of The Voice of Palestine.
I've been your co-host, Marian Kawas, and our closing piece of music is by Jewish-American singer David Rovix, the St. Patrick's Battalion. We dedicate this piece of music to all those working on the Global Boycott Israel movement, their perseverance, and their integrity. The struggle continues. Give me a T. G. Give me an R. R. Give me an E. G. Give me an A. A. Give me an F. F. Give me an O. o. Give me an N. N. What's that spell? Jesus. What's that spell? Jesus. One more time. Jesus. You're all going to get arrested. <laughs> My name is John Riley. I'll have your ear only a while. I left my dear home in Ireland. It was death, starvation, or exile. When I got to America, it was my duty to go. Enter the army and slog across Texas to join in the war against Mexico. And it was there in the Pueblos and hillsides That I saw the mistake I had made Part of a conquering army With the morals of a bayonet blade And there amidst all these poor dying Catholics Screaming children, the burning stench of it all Myself and two hundred Irishmen Decided to rise to the call From Dublin City to San Diego we witnessed freedom denied so we formed the St. Patrick Battalion and we fought on the Mexican side we formed the St. Patrick Battalion and we fought on the Mexican side we marched neath the green flag of St. Patrick emblazoned with Erin Gobra Right with the harp and the shamrock and Libertad para Mexicana. Just fifty years after Wolf Tone, five thousand miles away, the Yanks called us a legion of strangers, and they can talk as they may. But from Dublin City to San Diego, we witnessed freedom denied. So we formed the St. Patrick Battalion And we fought on the Mexican side We formed the St. Patrick Battalion And we fought on the Mexican side We fought them in Matamoros Where their volunteers were raping the nuns In Monterrey and Cerro Gordo We fought on as Ireland's sons we were the red-headed fighters for freedom Amidst these brown-skinned women and men Side by side we fought against tyranny And I dare say we'd do it again From Dublin City to San Diego We witnessed freedom denied So we formed the St. Patrick Battalion And we fought on the Mexican side We formed the St. Patrick Battalion, and we fought on the Mexican side. battles. Churubusco was the last. Overwhelmed by the cannons from Boston, we fell after each mortar blast. Most of us died on that hillside in the service of the Mexican state. 
So far from our occupied homeland, we were heroes and victims of fate. From Dublin City to San Diego, we witnessed freedom denied. So we formed the St. Patrick Battalion, and we fought on the Mexican side. From Dublin City to San Diego, we witnessed freedom denied. So we formed the St. Patrick Battalion, and we fought on the Mexican side. We formed the St. Patrick Battalion, and we fought on the Mexican side.